I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Praise be Jesus Christ. Now and forever. Welcome, everyone, to the next episode in the series, The Healing Wounds of Christ, conducted as a directed retreat with the Reverend Joseph Henschey of the Sacred Stigmata. So, hello once again, Father. Hello, Lisa. Always nice to be with you. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Alleluia. Alleluia. Well, you sound strong and happy today, and we're looking forward to everything you have to teach us. <laughs> so in the last uh, episode, you talked a great deal about the biblical foundations mm-hmm. of the Sacred Heart, mm-hmm. concentrating on the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. Uh, you talked about the prophets and mm-hmm. the Psalms. What will you do today? Well, I'll try to continue the same. We looked at the Old Testament and saw some real significant texts like Psalm 103, the love of God, and in fact that's the title of that psalm. Now we're looking at the New Testament. Now we don't mean by this that the Sacred Heart devotion is revealed as the devotion. Right. What we mean is that in the fullness of time, and I think under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the Church came to this devotion, and now, if I am correct, seems to be moving further into the devotion of God's mercy. But it's all here in Scripture. It's the fundamental revelation of Scripture. So we might say, I'm sorry. The love of God and the salvation of all of us forever. And so we might say that the Sacred Heart devotion is just a way of distilling or Mm -hmm. crystallizing or summarizing Mm -hmm. so much that spreads across the Old and New Testament about the love of God. Yeah, we could say like Michelangelo, he tried to interpret scripture in marble Mm -hmm. or in painting. Well, this devotion gradually seeped in over long, long centuries of reading these magnificent texts of God's love and God's mercy and challenging each and every one of us. So the devotion to the Sacred Heart or to the mercy is not a spiritual lollipop. Right. Making us happy and peaceful. It's to reach out to one another in forgiveness and to make the world a happier place. Yes, I understand. So will you start us off today with a prayer? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our mm-hmm. daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass mm-hmm. against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Mary, Mother of God, please pray for us. In the name of the Father, Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, well, we'll let you get started wherever wherever you like today. All right, well, in the Old Testament, uh, or in the previous lecture, we were uh, seeing the meek and humble of heart source of the Holy Spirit. In other words, the New Testament manifesting the love of God and leading us to further devotions, that this love of God is fulfilled in the devotion also to the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. This is another development which is steeped in Scripture. So today we'll look at a personal love as revealed in the New Testament, one that is without limits and is creative. God loved and so it came into being. So these hints which have long been associated with the sacred heart devotion to the piety of the church, do not express any particular mystery from the life of Christ. But this is the central hearth which animates all the special mysteries flowing from the events of Calvary, the cynical room, right down to our own time. In effect, all the words, all the works of Jesus has been inspired by a loving, merciful heart, the incarnation, his hidden life, his public life, his teachings, his miracles, his paschal mystery, passion, death, resurrection, and ascension, the sending of the Holy Spirit, the Church, the sacraments, the Mother of the Redeemer, the saints, all of the above are manifestations of the infinite love and mercy of Almighty God. 
as a result of all this, we do have one pithy central mystery that we, is reflected in the Sacred Heart devotion. The Sacred Heart has long been seen and understood as synthesizing the profound depths of the riches of his merciful love, expressing in a visible manner, above all, the personal will of God, one of love, mercy, without measure, in it, endless creativity. We might think of a symphony, a man being in, or a woman being inspired by some extraordinary event. We might, I don't know, think of Beethoven and what his great symphonies, what was the inspiration behind them. We've already noticed the sacred artists and the tremendous work they did to get across this idea of the power of God as well as of his infinite tenderness. I think one would never look on the Pietà of Michelangelo, which is now preserved in glass at the entrance of St. Peter's to the right-hand side. You can even see the fingernails mm -hmm. and the veins in yes. his and her. It's extraordinarily beautiful, very graceful. And this beautiful woman hovered over this dead body all in marble. It look, almost looks alive. And of course, with the typical Italian artistry, they have it in a glass case because somebody attacked it out of venom and it's, there's a beautiful blue light that shines in it and it's really, a, it's breathtaking, I think you could say. So what Revelation <clears throat> brings to us is God has a personal love. He knows the number of the hairs of our heads. The sparrow doesn't fall out of heaven is that an exaggeration or is it true? We think it's true. So it's a personal law. He said to us, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and called you so that you might bear fruit. We partake of the streams of living water so that then we might become living fountains for one another. We understand this teaching of the mercy and love of God so that we might by our lives live it and hand it over to others. So this is an interesting contrast you're drawing. In the Old Testament, of course, clearly God loves his people. Surely. He, We hear stories of individual mm -hmm. people Surely. throughout the Old mm -hmm. Testament. But in the New Testament, mm -hmm. Jesus manifests his personal yeah. love for particular people. And it becomes incarnate. It becomes incarnate. Flesh and, and blood. That's right. And and we hear his particular interactions with Peter or James and John or Mary Magdalene or Lazarus or the people he encounters in Samaria on his walks. You you get a sense of a much more direct and personal love beyond the love of a populace, which of course he loved his chosen people in the Old Testament, but it's a it's a different characterization. It is. It's a much more specific, much more emphatic, much more directed and or organized love of God in the person of Jesus Christ. So it's not only personal, it has no limit. When we when we say forgive one another, well it has to be kind of full. That doesn't mean we accept the bad that other people did, but we do need to realize that they are also sons and daughters of the Most High. So it's a personal love without limit or without any exclusion. He's loved his own even to the end, and he, he made them all so they're his own. No one has any greater love than he who gives up his life for those whom he loves, John fifteen thirteen. But Paul also adds, the Father has given up his own Son and has given all with him in Romans 8.32. What kind of a love is this? It's a love of mercy, pardon, creativity. He pardoned a sinful Samaritan with her five husbands and made of her a missionary of his merciful message in John 4. There's a man out there who has told me everything I did except it. I wonder if he's the one we are awaiting. He is the Savior of the world. These are the stages of faith. Peter, his apostle, would deny him three separate times. Peter cursed and swore, and a cock crowed, and the Lord looked at Peter in Luke twenty two sixty one. Luke Peter's entire life was again changed by the Lord's looking at him. 
Peter had been one of those the Lord had chosen and the one to be the head of the apostles. And now Peter becomes the one whom the Lord pardons and called to conversion of heart, whom he created as his vicar with a new heart. And John would exclaim, If our heart condemns us, God is still greater than our hearts. 1 John 3.20 the love, this love is always available. This loving mercy is perpetuated in reconciliation the Eucharist in a particular manner. Remain in me, the Master pleaded, just as he remains in us, John fifteen four. If we do love him, we keep his word, and his Father will love us all the more. The Most Holy Trinity will come and make their dwelling within us. This is the mystery of the divine heart. As the Word of God unveils this for us gradually but consistently over broad sweeps of time, it probably took more than a thousand years to write the Old Testament from the first traditions that came down in the royal court probably of David. And the New Testament probably is a full century in a few years maybe. Nobody seems to really know. This is insane love, as some of the mystics call it. God, you must be crazy to put up with us. Others would call it reckless. He doesn't care how we turn out temporarily. He is totally committed to our eternal salvation. It comes to us daily in the Eucharist as a permanent love. It's present in the mystery of the Church with all of its warts, but it provides a loving doctrine, loving people, visible and a living love. So the New Testament summarizes all of this and leads believers ever toward the physical heart of Jesus Christ. As we've seen so many times, it's a natural symbol, uh, uh, meaning love and deep thought and total commitment and so on. So this uh, brings attention as the expression of the amiable and loving second person of the Most Blessed Trinity. So we go then from this overall reading to zero in again on the pierced one. They will look on the one they have pierced. This is taken from a very beautiful study by a French scholar on the heart of Christ, the mystery of God, published in 1995. So as we've seen a few times, what does it mean to look on? That's not just a glance or to look at a, at a highway signal to see which, which is our next turn. This means to contemplate sincerely and deeply. This is the essential understanding of this passage. John is an eyewitness, and he wants us to be an experiential witness, to experience his love of God and hand it on to others. He relates to us what he looked on, listened to, and touched, as we read in 1 John chapter 1. He is inviting the church through the centuries to join him in this vision. Yet, even more importantly, the words of Jesus can never be neglected. Blessed are they who believe and have not seen. And this is where all of us are, found in John twenty twenty nine. This is the contemplative coming to faith, more than through hearing. We can hear and goes in one ear and out the other. This is a view not so much of the eyes, the pure of heart will see God, but it's more the penetrating gaze, the experiential contemplation of his words. It is necessary for each believer to ponder, think, think of, contemplate Jesus Christ and with some interest, some attention. Profound, contemplative prayer is that interior regard desirous of knowing more in depth, ever more intimately, the risen Lord presented to us in faith. So this contemplation is not reserved for the monks. Vatican II in two points Two documents speaks very poignantly of us contemplating. In the document on the liturgy, the church is contemplative and active, primarily contemplative. In De Verbum 8, we grow in faith by contemplation, study, magisterium, and uh, experience. So there is need for some quiet, from quiet to have this happen. Our world is so noisy, and we might mention in this connection a very interesting recent book by Cardinal Robert Cardinal Sarah, The Power of Silence, 
against the dictatorship of noise. Everything is so noisy and we have to be very careful we don't let the liturgy become noise. It's meant to be a music accompanying and elevating the, the sentiments of the heart and the mind. So the idea is that it's through this extended peaceful contemplation mm-hmm. that the priorities of our lives begin to reorder. Surely. It says you've said mm-hmm. in other lectures mm-hmm. Christ goes from being a value mm-hmm. to in yeah. our lives to the right. value to the most important value. That's right. That's and right. then and then the and then the worldly things around us reorder in priority. Right. We don't see them in the same way. And so most likely we feel more peace of heart mm-hmm. and mind. We're more accepting of what mm-hmm. goes on in our lives. Mm-hmm. Uh, we trust in the will of God mm-hmm. better because we have allowed ourselves this sense That's of right. peace. Mm-hmm. So it's not just decompression. It's not recreation. No. It, is a, it is a road of, on which we move to reorder our priorities. Is that right? It's ascetical. It takes effort and time. It's not easy to do this. And many of us who have tried this for years sometimes get a little bit discouraged. We don't seem to be making progress. Well, it seems to me the old Roman metaphor is just hand your thesis in, let somebody else judge it. Perfectionism can often be the great enemy of completion or even trying. So no one can enter into a profound knowledge of God, even though facetiously sometimes theology is the only science in the world that so many people have become experts without studying. Mm. It's amazing. But not n- n- no one can ever enter intimacy and the sublimity of these most wonderful secrets of the merciful love of Jesus Christ. We have nothing like this in the world around us. We know what justice is. We know what power is. But how about the power of mercy? That we don't see a lot of. So it's happened to him on that painful journey from Golgotha towards Jerusalem, where there were many passers-by, and even those who might refer to him as Lord, Lord, went right on by without ever fathoming this mystery. They remain in the darkness of of that Sabbath night. The vocation of the church is to watch and to pray to struggle to find the light of the, in the darkness of the night. Nativity, Gethsemane, Resurrection, all gave us a glimpse of the new dawn. As we read in Psalm 130, we're like watchmen waiting for the coming of a new day, waiting to grasp this great high priest born on the distant mountains before the first streaks of dawn. Elizabeth of the Trinity prayed that in prayer she might look toward the Lord in a totally awakened manner in faith. One of the great lines of St. Ignatius, uh, St. Augustine, a convert from a terribly sinful life, said, Timio Jesum transeuntum. I fear Jesus passing me by. He's on his way to Calvary, and he's inviting us, come, follow me, by every vocation. When we go to Holy Communion, we are in a kind of a antechamber of the eternal celestial liturgy where the great high priest is thanking the Trinity for the gift of God's mercy. And we want to be a part of that eternal choir as long, for all eternity as we speak in Psalm 19, the heavens bespeak the glory of God. So in trying to fathom this mystery of love, we, we just have no example of it. That's probably not true. We do have some, I mean, loving people who totally pour themselves out for others. But to find this level of forgiveness, it's at least rare in our human elements, of human lives. So the committed believer is enormously helped when he or she is able to look at this pierced heart. Especially we see that in those among us who are suffering. On another road, from Jerusalem to Jericho, Many passed by without so much as even noticing the poor man who had fallen among robbers. and They left him for dead along the roadside. But with the vision of faith, much like a person accustomed to familiar surroundings in dim light, most of us can find our way down a dark corridor 
without a line if if it's part of a daily detail. But they but oftentimes such people are able to notice details that the untrained eye would miss, like how many people come inside this room is dirty, and the man living in it doesn't see that, but the woman sweeps up a basket full of junk on the floor. <laughs> Like an artist looking out at nature, most of us just see colors and heat or cold or rain. But this is something like a person before the sacred heart of Jesus. Little by little, this love of God makes more of an impression on contemplative reflection in the prayerful believer allowing him or herself to be taken over, as the mystical expression is, to waste time with God in the effort to pray seriously. An essential ingredient of devotion to the Sacred Heart is to look upon the pierced one with a contrite heart, desirous and hopeful of conversion. Those whose prayerful insights have encouraged this devotion in the Church insist so much on the meditation on one's own sinfulness, a stance already noted in the New Testament and also preached very in the early centuries of the church. The pierced heart, so full of love for the sinners of all time and of those in most in need, invites all of us to serious contrition, authentic regret for our own faults, but always with the hope of God's mercy manifested in this open heart to all come seeking him. Therefore, the believer comes to appreciate firsthand when he or she is forgiven. And forgiveness then enters into his or her heart as an experience. Perfect contrition is far beyond the ordinary. In truth, it may be reserved to privileged souls who correspond to their own prayer and the spirit of the liturgy, confession, but always with hope in the infinite mercy of God. So this is a very Mm. important uh, thing Mm. you're talking about, I think, for us ordinary people, and, and it's in my personal life something I have struggled with a lot. Mm-hmm. You know, when I converted to Catholicism, many of my friends were worried about me because they thought I would just be drowning in a sea of Catholic guilt because, mm-hmm. you know, this is the this is the stereotype. But, mm-hmm. you know, the gradually, gradually, I think I come to understand, and I want to ask you if this is right, that if we if if we look at being corrected in our behavior the way many adults correct um children you know they'll say look at what you did look at what you did that was so bad don't do that don't do that stop that mm-hmm. but what christ seems to mm-hmm. say is come now mm-hmm. you're better than this right. realize right. what you have done mm-hmm. so it's not this kind of admonition admonition Mm. it's this although of course there is that recognition but it is Mm. come now you're better than this rise to your higher self is that right i think it's true even though sometimes parents have to exercise self well sure sure the training of a child but in a way unless we become like children and willing to listen and to accept enjoined us and sometimes harsh correction on the part of god's word well you know put Come follow me every day with a cross. So it's not an easy, easy message to do. And it's not that he's yelling at us, but he doesn't like sin. No, He just no. doesn't like it. He hates sin. But as St. Thomas so said so beautifully, God loves Jesus' pardon much more than he hates our sin. Yes. So in that sense, I think we're uh, all home free. So the pier side is a window into the Trinity and a mirror for Christianity. And so we we want to rise to our best selves Mm -hmm. out of amazement and Mm -hmm. gratitude Mm -hmm. for the willing Mm -hmm. sacrifice Mm -hmm. that Christ made for Mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. You know, this movie, Saving Private Ryan, about Mm -hmm. the Second World War, Mm -hmm. often gets used as a comparison. Um, The captain goes hunting for Private Ryan, finds him, and and gets killed Mm -hmm. in the process of it, and says... His last words to Private Ryan are, earn this, earn this. And people often say, well, you know, this is this is like Christ. But in a way, it's not like Christ mm-hmm. because that captain didn't go off on a mission knowing he was going to die. Mm-hmm. He didn't 
give his life gladly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think this is the difference. Christ Christ has made a sacrifice mm-hmm. for us that he agreed to. He knew what happened. He did it out mm-hmm. of great love. Mm-hmm. And so um, we want to, in amazement, be worthy sure. of that sacrifice. Sure. You yeah, know? there's great truth to that. I think in that movie, the captain certainly shows Christ-like figures, uh, like Christ-like uh, uh, Qualities, yes. But he didn't accompany Private Ryan through his life. Yeah. I mean, he, whereas Christ is with us every step of the way. We, we offer everything through Christ our Lord. The gesture was Christ-like, like David in another context, mourning over his sinful son. So this captain who obeyed his, his military commanders even though four or five men died trying to save one Private Ryan whose brothers had been killed or somebody belonging to him had been killed. So there's no perfect example, but that certainly is a good one. So contrition is not the painful, ever-wounded, negative sense of shame or the cry of the proud person who's never good enough, whose faults are not hidden enough. There is profound depths in the prayer of Peter. Depart from me, O Lord. I am a sinful man. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. The prayer of the public, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Anticipated purgatory is more a state of mind and heart rather than a place. The prophets and the Psalms centuries before Christ spoke of the crushed and bruised heart of the Messiah. They understood the love of God, much much like that of a totally caring mother in Psalm 131, the psalm of holy abandonment. I'm in my mother's arms and have just been weaned. So Jesus teaches by words and by deeds, allowing his heart side to be torn open, to be opened. Is This then becomes the source of the streams of salvation, as we see in Isaiah 12, 3 and John 7. The contemplative gaze on the pierced heart can transform the committed believer. There's a popular prayer based on all of these texts. Jesus, meek and humble of heart, make my heart like unto yours. This is a prayer offered for generations. So far beyond the familiar melody, there is here a profound theological pertinence. The ideal presented here is to contemplate Jesus' Christ, bit by bit, to whatever capacity we can each and every day, in order to be gradually transformed into him, to put on his mind. Paul sets the ideal of his Christological mysticism. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, Galatians 2.20, that key text of Christological mysticism, that we live the life of Christ Jesus in grace. So the Christian ideal through the centuries means to be transformed into Jesus Christ, to put on his mind, to live his life, and to be from now on one with him as best we can, so that what is his will becomes more and more ours, and what we are be more and more what he is. Our hearts need to be given over to his, and we do this every time we try to pray or study our Eucharist or any devotion that we have the hopes that there will be one heart between us and God. This is why there will always be a strong bond between the theology of the heart of Christ and Eucharistic sacramental union. This well-known principle of St. Augustine applies here beautifully. In the Eucharist, we eventually become what we receive, that living the life of Christ. Eucharistic communion taken over by a divine power, that's what it means, like we Remember the prophets that are lifted by the hair and brought from one place to another, driven out into the desert. That's what this means, that we are driven to try to strive to persevere in what we are trying to do. We're being taken over by a divine power of mercy. The Son did not become man just to give us an example. That's one of the reasons of the incarnation. But he's a supreme paradigm in our spiritual journey. Rather, by the fire of the Holy Spirit, he enkindles the brambles of our hearts 
and renders them ever less unworthy of God's merciful love. It seems that this is what Paul was talking about in an oft-quoted passage, Philippians 2, 1 to 11. Be united in your convictions and your self-love with a common purpose and a common mind. Let everyone be self-effacing. Always consider the other person better than yourself so that nobody thinks of his own interests first, but everybody thinks of other people's interests instead. This is called fraternal humility. Whatever gifts we have, like Mike and Mustard have gifts we don't have, so that each one of us becomes a part of this magnificent masterpiece called the human being or the church. So in your minds you must be the same as Jesus. Not in your imagination, not in just making believe. We are physically, ontologically, one with Christ Jesus by baptism. What does it mean to be the same? Well, he did not cling to his equality with God. While being a man 88 years of age, I remember many aspects of the church of the 50s that I liked. Well, they're gone now. They're no longer as evident, the huge numbers and all of this thing. So some of our treasured possessions we give up in the sense that we believe we're being carried along the king's highway. He emptied himself to assume the condition of a slave. Well, here we have endless meditations, as we know from the exegetical torment of these passages. Are we ever spiritual enough I think most of them say no. Have we done all we could have done? No. Uh, should we then therefore always be ashamed? No. Be ashamed if there's hope in it. Lord, I haven't yet succeeded. I'm still trying. Help my lack of effort. So his self-emptying was accepting death, death on a cross. Ours might be accepting for a while a difficult life. Aspects of life that are very hard to accept. Sickness, constant sickness, or ups and downs, or troubles in community or families, and so on. So <clears throat> then the Father raised him up and gave him a name above all names. All being in heaven, on earth, and the underworld, bend the knee at the name of Jesus, and every tongue would acclaim, Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now we remember this as the third psalm of 48 Saturdays of the year. This is how we prepare for the resurrection of Sunday. So let's go on in this text. He breathed on them. Well, where did we see that before? In the creation story. He breathed on them. In John 20, Jesus came in and stood among them and he said to them, Peace, be with you. And he showed them his hands and his side. As the Father sent me, I am now sending you. After saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. For those whose sins you forgive, they're forgiven. But those whose sins you retain, they are retained. He just pointed at his heart. He breathed on them and said, Forgive, forgive yourself and forgive one another. So the reader needs to remember that the purpose of all of this reflection is to try to present the Trinitarian dimension of the devotion to the sacred heart. It all begins with the love of the Father, the bleeding to death of God the Son, and the total giving of the Holy Spirit. This is already clear that the heart of the heart we're speaking about here is that of Christ. It's both human and divine, reflecting the merciful love of the Father, and this has been retained in his risen body. So this is a golden opportunity to ponder somewhat on the impotence of the Holy Spirit in this devotion, John twenty twenty two. John 20 presents to the church the John 9 Pentecost with a view <clears throat> as well to the theophany found in Luke regarding the Pentecost in Acts chapter 1 taking place 50 days after the resurrection. The sudden appearance of blood and water flowing out of the pierced side of Jesus was already an initial Pentecost. This is brought forward to us in 1 John 5, 6 when he changes the order. 
On Calvary, the altar is the blood and the water. But in conversion, there are three witnesses, Holy Spirit, water of baptism, and the blood of the Eucharist. So the initial Pentecost was this outpouring of blood and water, which to be transformed happened in the expiration of Jesus Christ, the sending out of the Spirit. So the images and the mysteries interpenetrate. They're not in opposition with one another. But this depends on one trying to understand at what point it is necessary for the Spirit to come forth, to infuse himself all over the world, and to fulfill the promises of Jesus. It is good that I go in order for the Spirit to come. So I think in this political morass in which the world finds itself, There is such anger and such division. We just seem to lose patience in hoping that somehow peace again will come to the human heart. But the the goods are there. The Lord has breathed out his Holy Spirit. His pardon is for all of us for the asking. So therefore the risen Christ breathes on his disciples. And with that, the power of life which unites him eternally to the Father, he, he shares that. We're told in Genesis, when the Lord breathed into the dust, he breathed into it a divine life. Well, Christ does the same here, the divine life of mercy, pardon. That's the first response of the life of God within us, according to John. Pentecost is a new creation, a work of the Lord completed in the Holy Spirit. The third person of the Trinity hovered over the waters in Genesis 1-2. And this is what it does over Mary. The Holy Spirit will overshadow you and bring forth a a new world. When the world will be renewed in the mystery of the past, the Spirit is there, assuring growth in all things. The new creation annuls nothing of the first creation, but fulfills it, accomplishes it wondrously. We're not meant to destroy the world, we're taught to better it. And I think the age of geniuses in which we live is a marvelous testimony of the human mind's commitment to developing the gifts that God has given to us. Whether these are recognized that way or not, we live in a wonderful world, as Louis Armstrong would remind us. It's a wonderful, wonderful world. Whoever we may be, we exist in the Spirit, that is, in a participation of the life of the Trinity. So this gift of the Holy Spirit on Easter night is a meager step forward in the realization of a work foreseen by the Father before the centuries and is realized in the course of time with a pedagogy always motivated by love and mercy. Nothing more important could ever exist in the history of the world than the sending out the Holy Spirit. It's with a view to the Spirit that the Lord has be- that the Word became man. He suffered His passion in order to renew the covenant and to gather all the children of God spread everywhere, bringing them together under his arms on the cross. He has risen in order to pour out into all human flesh his Holy Spirit of eternal love and pardon. Irenaeus said it very well. The Father's plan is to recapitulate all things in Jesus Christ, this work which the Spirit accomplishes in these last times. We might think, and rightfully so, Our prayer is junk, or our learning is extraordinarily limited. It is. But when it's worked on or accepted through Christ our Lord, it somehow becomes recapitulated through Jesus and his risen risen mercy. So in the church which lives of him and of his mercy, without ever becoming all nor becoming the proprietor, the Holy Spirit is the guardian of the divine who is still alive. These things happened more than 2,000 years ago, and in many souls they still are very effective. So without ever being to speak of an age of the Spirit, which would succeed or take over that of the Divine Son, it would be necessary to train how Pentecost accomplishes the Father's plan to the point that at the end the Son himself submits to the One who submitted all to himself. This is the great mystery of divine, merciful love. And so our, our, would it be accurate to say that the Holy Spirit is 
is the mechanism of incarnation. It is, mm. it, I, I don't want to use a word like cause because I know that well, has technical the, meaning to it. The spirit will overshadow Mary. Right. And so it's, it is a, when God breathed life into Adam and Eve, mm. um, the b- overshadowed Mary and Christ was incarnate mm. within mm. her. He breathes on the disciples, and then they become incarnate manifestations of His mm-hmm. divinity. It's the the Holy Spirit is the the breath of God, which then incarnates right. His His love in another object. That's right. Meaning the person, the person, the second yeah, person, person, the right. Trinity. And then, of course, this is what it does by healing our wounds. The Spirit of God's love breathes on them. Or maybe like a mother who used to kiss our sores when we fell down. <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right. Or in the old days, you told me that at baptisms, the priest would breathe, breathe. upon that's the right. baby as a, right. as a, a carrying that forward, right. that, that symbol, that symbol that new life that's idea. coming, which is present in the creation and present in the resurrection. Uh, so it's right here that we discover the mystery of the heart of Christ. It's a living sign of the total poverty, humility of God. This is not, of course, a poverty that lacks anything, but rather one that is motivated by an excess of love which moves God not to cling to his own self-sufficiency, but rather inspires God freely to give of himself without reserve. We just don't know how to harmonize this gift without reserve with the infinite richness of his powerful creation from which all of life proceeds. The Son, with his pierced heart, the giver of the Holy Spirit, is inseparably the humble mendicant of our love and the one which fills us beyond all poverty. Remember that famous line of Second Corinthians 8, 9. God became poor so that we might become rich with his poverty. God became poor by becoming one of us and we were poor in our sinfulness and he shared by his lowliness the greatness of his pardon. This is all in order to show that the true richness is not that which one possesses, but that which one gives. We often think of, oh, he's this or he's that. If he doesn't share it, he's not much help to the to the enterprise. So the work of the triune God is one of perfect coherence. The creative act, without in any way lessening God, enables us to live in his grace without our own importance and personal dignity. It's brought about through the mediation of the Son became man in order to share with us the riches and limits of our own existence. This is all geared toward the Pentecost, which gives meaning to all that is, the ultimate victory of the divine generosity over human selfishness. All we have to do is to allow ourselves to be led wherever God chooses in the daily gift of ourselves to the Father, to our brothers and sisters, husbands and wives to each other, mothers and fathers to their families, single people to whatever their tasks are, and priests and religious to the task of Jesus himself at hand, the mission, the apostolic mission assigned to them. This is a daily gift to the Father we try to make and to our brothers and sisters, and so we read in Titus chapter 3, verses 3 to 7. We lived in wickedness and in ill will, hating each other and even hating ourselves. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior for mankind were revealed, this was not because he was concerned with any righteous actions we might do ourselves. It was for no other reason other than his compassion that he saved us by means of the cleansing water of rebirth and by renewing us with the Holy Spirit, which he has so generously poured over us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. He did this so that we would be justified by grace to become heirs looking forward to inheriting eternal life. Now these are, we read these glibly at times because there's so much in them and we get lost in the detail. But to take a text like that and read it word by word in a quiet meditation would be a wonderful way to make a visit to the Blessed Sacrament. Or again, Second Timothy chapter 1, verses 6 to 14. 
And that is why, Timothy, I, Paul, am reminding you, fan into flame the gift you have, God gave you when I laid my hands on you. God's gift was not one of timidity, but the spirit of power and love, self-control. So you are never to be ashamed of witnessing to the Lord or ashamed of me for being his prisoners. But with me, bear the hardships for the sake of the good news, relying on the power of God who saved us and called us to be holy, not because of anything we have done, but for his own purpose and by his own grace. His grace has already been given to us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time but has only been granted to us by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. He abolished death, and he has proclaimed life and immortality through good news. And I have been named its herald, its apostle, its teacher. It is only because of this that I am experiencing hardships here and now. But I have not lost confidence, because I know who it is that I have put my trust in. And I have no doubt at all, that he is able to take care of all that I have entrusted to him until that day. So therefore, keep as your pattern the town teaching you have for me in faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. You have been trusted to look after something precious, guarded with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Even though Paul was talking as an ordained minister, we too have been given a gift that we had to fan into flame to share with one another. The first gift is witness. How we try to live our lives. That's the most eloquent sermon we could ever, ever give. And certainly better than anything we could conjure up. What does it mean when Thomas says, my Lord and my God in John 20? So we're looking at this piss one and it's verse much as we did in the earlier part of the course but with a slightly different twist with a unique emphasis on God's forgiveness. Thomas look, doesn't tell us whether or not Thomas actually put his fingers in the wound or his fists into the side of Christ. But seeing it, Thomas responds, my Lord and my God. So we don't know if he really did. What we do know is that once the doubting Thomas pronounces his faith for all ages to live, my God and my, my Lord and my God. They used to tell me in Rome that in Ireland there were many communities that would say this, at the elevation of the body and the blood Mm -hmm. in the consecration of the Mass. This profession of faith occurs as a manifestation of at the manifestation of the sacred stigmata and the presentation of the wounded heart of the risen Lord. So devotion to the sacred heart can only be understood in faith. It's an appeal to an ever more intense faith among its devotees. So on the ecumenical level we wouldn't start with the devotion to the sacred heart. We were sad with being a good person. And yet, when we become friends, they would try to share the thought that the love of God moves us in this or that direction towards friendship with one another, the most effective, effective apostolate we may have. So Jesus' appeal that echoes to each of us down through the generations has echoed from this encounter with the doubting Thomas. Do not be disbelieving, but believing. It's easy to doubt and to ask questions, and not every question has an answer. But it's enormously meritorious to believe without seeing. The opening of the heart of Jesus cannot be contemplated except in faith. Otherwise, the retaining of it would seem to be simply simply a protest for an unjust wound. So many times, manifestations against injustice are very easy to conjure up because there's so much unjust in our world. What we do need is of some prophets that know how to bring peace to the world by their own loving commitment in God's mercy. So the loving commitment to the Father that was a horrendous capital injustice becomes the means of redeeming the world. It is in faith that we are able to go beyond the visible sign toward the mystery of invisible love, which this testifies. It is in this sense that the devotion to the heart of Christ is sacramental. It's a visible sign that manifests the grace of God. It is sheer eisegesis to present the doubting of St. Thomas, as many do, 
as a patron of systematic doubt, I won't believe until I see. This was rejected by Vatican I in Denziger 3013 and 3014. This was a way of, I won't believe until I understand. It's not the way faith is. And it doesn't, it's not adapted to what we believe. God has incarnated his word so that we can understand it. But it still is a challenge. Speak, Lord, your servant listens. Mary treasured the word in her heart, even though she did not understand it. We do believe, Lord, help us our unbelief. So Thomas also made another statement of great depth in John eleven sixteen. Let us go to, and we will die with him. And that's what will happen. So Thomas would offer, after his doubt, this great profession of faith. We, we are studying here, my Lord and my God. And so do we have any examples in the New Testament of the wavering of faith in the apostles oh, sure. once they once they have moved through Pentecost? Absolutely, that prayer of the apostles. We believe, help our unbelief. Or throughout Mark's gospel, you've been with me all this time and you still do not understand. No, I mean after the resurrection. So oh, yeah. once mm-hmm. once the, the, the apostles are are ordained right. by the Holy Spirit after yeah. Pentecost, That's and right. they go out with fervor, right. mm-hmm. having seen the resurrected Christ, mm-hmm. they no longer wavered. Is that right? That's true, even though they had squabbles among themselves. They right. didn't waver. We believe that timorous apostles were made heroic martyrs by their conversion and their resurrection. And that's what this scene is. Jesus points to his heart. As the Father sent me, I am now sending you. So faith is a struggle as long as we live. To be needs to be renewed. And as we know, the early church had many divisive squabbles that they had to work out. And uh, But after the resurrection, we don't have any clear indication that this apostle or that one failed. Failed, right. Uh, and so... They- they were confirmed in in apostolic boldness, that that's famous, right. we dare to say, as we say in the Holy Mass, that's parisia, apostolic boldness, even though we are a minority, we're not afraid to say the word and to say it until the end of our life. Well, that's, and that's a good what, point. Yeah, and it's, and it's very interesting because those of us in the modern world, mm-hmm. um, we waver a lot. You so, know, we waver a lot. Yeah. And... And the difference is, Mm. I think, that the apostles Mm. saw God. Mm. And, you know, when when we talk about Thomas, the doubter, Mm. for example, and we we call him Doubting Thomas, and and Christ says to him, Blessed are those Mm. who, who don't see and believe. You know, Thomas only wanted what the rest of the apostles had already had. That's right. he, he speaks for them here, yeah, and that's what yeah. I'm saying. They were all converted by the resurrection. Right, and so now the I think one of the questions that mulls in my mind is, would we too have the same confirmation and conviction if we saw God and do we fail to recognize him when we do see him? Well, I think we could again use the example of the apostles. They saw God and ran away at, on Good Holy Thursday night to a man. They ran away. They saw him, but could God exist in Gethsemane? Can God be present in defeat? Can God be present somehow in sin, the terrible bad example the church has offered? In some way, he is. He, he is. He, he, he's present and he's trying to lead us up out of this morass to not to give up ourselves. We're not confirmed in this lifetime, which they may have been. It seems they had very special apostolic graces, and we see that in the Acts of the Apostles, this power of miracles. We don't have any of that. So we are even more in a more difficult position, and Jesus says you will see even greater things if you come to follow me. Right. And I think we do when we touch another person's life, or another person touch ours, as you often speak of your hospice patients, how well they teach you. Yes, and, and that's one of the things that that you say. The apostles all saw, but God, in their lifetimes, yeah. when Christ was alive, they recognized that that's who it was at some mm-hmm. level, but it didn't penetrate no. the testadure no. 
until they saw him in the resurrection. Mm. But and, even when they did see it, then they were arguing who's going to be closest to him in heaven. They had no idea what mission he was at. As the Father sent me, I am sending you. They thought this was, they loved his wise sermons. Who is this man? Speaks with such authority. They loved his miracles, and they were keeping protection over the little ones that couldn't come bother Christ. Let the little ones come unto me. So they were a mix. They were the bad news bears in many ways throughout their lives. They all died heroically in the service of Christ. And many make the contrast, even though we don't have much biblical data on this, that timorous apostles were made courageous martyrs. Were made courageous so martyrs, it's, it's, right. It is what right. we're all meant to be, and by this course hope to be, converts by the PSI. Yes, but opened I opened up to a mercy of God. Yes, but I think it's it's as you say. I wonder sometimes how much we see we see God, mm -hmm. just like Thomas said. I want to see. Well, we can see Him too in a veiled image. In a veiled image, very veiled image, and yeah. it's very bleak and dark. And there are three stages. There's the there's the purgative, unitive. I mean, what do you call it? Purgative, illuminative, illuminative, and unitive. Yeah, it, it's a stage, like the woman of Samaria. There's someone out there that did me great thing. I wonder if, and then finally she comes to faith, or as Jesus Himself says, when you have bad eyesight, you look in the distance, say they're, they're trees, and then they begin to move. Oh, they're men. Oh, it's Tom, Dick, and Harry. There's a progression that's long and arduous, and without any apparent rewards. Blessed are those who persevere, mm -hmm. and that's what we're trying to do here with this directed retreat. Yeah. And I think that sometimes, mm. too, that this this awareness of the veiled image of God, mm. it happens a lot in my hospice work, mm. where one mm. of my patients will say to me, where did you come from? Mm. What makes you come to me? Mm. And, and, and it's, I know it's an expression of gratitude, mm. and it also is... Um, a, a, an awareness that something extraordinary mm. is happening. Mm. And what is it? What is it? Mm -hmm. And of course, I feel exactly the same way sure. in return. Mm. How did I come to cross your path? Mm -hmm. And uh, such a wonderful teacher, mm -hmm. such a beautiful human being, mm -hmm. and not perfect in any mm -hmm. sense, I, but such a wonderful human mm -hmm. being. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it's God. Well, it is, and it, I think in every good friendship, I think these hospice patients, hospice cl clients or friends develop a deeper level of friendship because they, they're really, at wit's end, they're, they're powerless. They're physically, they can't even take a drink of water. So they see somebody interested in them. It inspires them, hopefully, about Christ as it inspires you by their wisdom. Mm -hmm. And this is what we mean. When we partake of the living streams, we become fountains of living water, mm -hmm. faith, hope, and love. Well, as we come down to the close of this hour, it makes me think of my my patient who just died uh, uh, a few months ago, and I was um, my service to him was to read the Bible out loud to him. Mm -hmm. And on the last visit I had with him, which I didn't know would be my last visit, he he just said to me, "Keep reading, keep reading." And at the time, I thought he wanted me in that moment to keep reading, and so I did. But now that I think back on it, he just is, he, it was a, a much bigger admonition. That's right. It's like, go build my church. And Francis thought it was a little hut in Athesi, and it was the universal church. Right. That's a great lesson. It is for a all great of us. lesson. Keep reading. Keep reading. Keep reading. And so um, we'll we'll bring this to a, a close today. We're about out of time. You've given us once again so much valuable mm. food for thought. So will you finish us with a prayer that we be able to digest it? <laughs> Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Mary, Mother of the Church. Please pray for us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for listening. And thank you once again, Father, for teaching. All right. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.